I was telling Linda over here, I've never been so nervous in my life. <laughs> Give me 166 kids and I'm okay, but adults, I don't know. <laughs> Welcome to the University of Texas Marine Science Institute. My name is Adriana Reza. I'm the education coordinator here. So I run all of the field trips and outreach programs that the university does. We're also associated with the Mission Aransas National Estuarine Research Reserve, and that is a program through NOAA. Um, so they pay my salary. <laughs> so I need to give a shout out to them. Um, so tonight, um, a couple of logistics before we get started. Um, emergency exits are two doors in the back of the room, two doors over here on the side. We have one door over here, and of course, the doors that you entered. We can all exit safely from this room. We are at capacity of 166, and we cannot go or let any other people in. So we are it for tonight. Uh, restrooms, if you need to use them, you can exit this door right here, and they're right across the hall. Um, same with the water fountain. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. I'll either be standing over here or in the back of the room. Um, okay, so for tonight, um, we had a change in our uh, programming. Um, our original presenter could not make it down um, to speak with us and make the presentation tonight. However, we have an amazing panel of people here that would like to share um, about the whooping cranes. Um, and we're gonna have a fantastic night. I kind of eavesdropped on them earlier and heard what they were talking about. They have some great things to share with us. Um, so in that, I wanna say this is a very informal presentation. If you have questions, um, please let us know. They're gonna be um, speaking first, talking a little bit, but then have a lot of questions from the audience. So we're expecting this like back and forth conversation. I do have a microphone that's kind of fun um, that I'll be passing around. It is a foam cube and the microphone is at the top, but it's soft enough that we can toss to each other if I can't make it to you, okay? Let's not uh, hit anybody on the head, but um, be aware that that thing is, is soft and we can toss it. Okay, yeah, <laughs> add a little entertainment to tonight. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to our panel to get started. Thank you. Good evening. My name is George Archibald, and I'm... <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I'm supposed to share this presentation with my colleague, Ron Schaefer, from Wood Buffalo National Park but unfortunately his passport expired and they wouldn't let him into the country. So we're so sad about that. I'm from Canada and I want to know, I know there are a lot of Canucks down here. Put your hand up if you're from Canada. Oh, wow, quite a few people. That's great. And are you familiar with the program, The Nature of Things? You all watch that? And uh, a, a film crew from Canada is preparing a film about the whooping cranes and they're with us this evening. And those of you from Canada will know all about David Suzuki. Well, his daughter is here and she is, stand up, Sarika. <laughs> Uh, she's uh, helping with this film as the moderator. So we're very happy to have the film crew with us to tell the Whooping Crane story. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ron and his work at Wood Buffalo National Park. He's from the Dene uh, Native American tribe, Native Canadian tribe, and there is 11 different groups of Diné Indians, each a little bit distinct within the boundaries of the Wood Buffalo National Park. And they have become very involved in the whooping cranes because some of the whooping cranes are nesting outside of Wood Buffalo's boundary uh, on their land. 
And Ron, who is the chief of police in the little town of Fort Smith, has a great passion for the whooping cranes. And he goes on his ATV over the wilderness <laughs> to the nests of the whooping cranes. And the first time I met him, he's showing me the eggs of the whooping crane. He's holding them. <laughs> Now, if you're in Wood Buffalo, Buffalo National Park, you need no end of permits even to fly over the nests, let, let alone go to the nests or <laughs> touch the eggs. <laughs> and they have a lot of uh, ravens up there in the park. And the ravens are very clever birds. And they will watch humans disturbing the cranes and before the cranes, after the humans leave and before the cranes get back, there's a chance that a raven might destroy their eggs. So they have to be very careful about that. So uh, I said to Ron, aren't you nervous about attracting ravens to the nests of the whooping cranes? <laughs> and he sort of smiled and said, there aren't any ravens around my hoopers. <laughs> I didn't ask any more questions. <laughs> some of the wetlands, we believe some of the wetlands at Wood Buffalo National Park are perched on permafrost. That's ice under the soil. We call them perched wetlands. And one of our concerns with cranes that are nesting in very cold areas that have permafrost, such as the Tibetan Plateau, Mongolia, many places in Russia, is the melting of the permafrost as the world becomes a little bit warmer. And at a recent meeting in Calgary, we had people from Wood Buffalo National Park, including several indigenous people, including Ron, and uh, we had a discussion about that. And the researchers have not done a, had, at that time had not done a study of the impact of permafrost loss in Wood Buffalo National Park. They weren't even sure where the permafrost was and wasn't. But uh, these indigenous people told us that some of the wetlands in the park have suddenly disappeared. And uh, based on what I've observed in Mongolia, that would mean the permafrost melted and the wetlands just drained out. And then they said, in other areas of the park where there's forest, suddenly there's all this water. So if the water leaves one area, it's, it's perhaps going to come up in another area. There's a research team from the University of Waterloo in Canada that's now studying the impact of permafrost loss at Wood Buffalo National Park. We don't know how serious it is, but it's something that requires research. So in the future years at this festival, maybe we'll have some of those scientists come and tell us more about the, the, the impact. Um, I'm happy to be with you tonight to introduce my colleagues. We're each going to talk about something different uh, that have to do with the whooping cranes. So I'm going to pass the microphone to my colleague, Sarah Zamorski, who comes from Louisiana, where she's studying the new non-migratory flock of whooping cranes that's breeding in southwestern Louisiana. Good evening. Yeah, so I'm sort of at the complete opposite end of <laughs> um, the flyway from where George is talking. So Louisiana and um, we work way down in the southwest part of the state. Um, and so about 13 years ago, we began a reintroduction project in the state um, to try and establish a non-migratory population. Historically, there were whooping cranes in Louisiana. And so we want to try and um, bring them back. 
And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you all about is um, one of the biggest reasons for the decline of whooping cranes, not just in Louisiana, but across um, all of their range was the loss of wetland habitat. Um, and that was mostly replaced by agriculture. But what we've found and seen in Louisiana, and you could go to one of the next slides, Carter, is that actually the agriculture that took over much of the um, wet meadows and a lot of the um, freshwater marsh, not all of it, but a lot of it, uh, is rice and crawfish agriculture, which actually in some ways is very much like a shallow freshwater marsh. And so the whooping cranes actually love it. And so a lot of our cranes, even though um, they've been released in marsh habitat, when they are on um, their own and they leave the marsh, they're finding all this agricultural habitat and they're spending their time there, including setting up their territories, nesting and raising chicks. Um, so one of the things that's been really interesting, and you can see this for those of you who aren't familiar and prior to moving to Louisiana, I knew nothing about rice and crawfish agriculture. Um, so that is a crawfish boat that is passing by harvesting crawfish. And you can see that that crane is just sitting right on her nest. Um, and so what we've found is that it actually is very compatible. Uh, certainly we've had some landowners and farmers who are a little bit nervous when they first have whooping cranes on their property and we contact them and yes, whooping cranes do eat crawfish but they're not only eating crawfish, uh, they're eating lots of things. And the farmers can go about their business uh, while the whooping cranes live on the property, nest and even raise chicks. And it might be a little hard to see, but um, in the photo here, there's actually two newly hatched whooping crane chicks and that is on a crawfish farm. Um, and so some of the crawfish farmers and landowners in Louisiana have probably gotten more observations of whooping crane breeding and chick rearing than any biologist who's ever studied them because they're seeing them on a daily basis when they're working on their property, checking their pumps and levees, harvesting their crawfish. Um, so it's been really interesting, I think unexpected. We sort of plan for the whooping cranes to stay in the freshwater marsh. There's still a lot of freshwater marsh habitat in Southwest Louisiana but the cranes had other ideas. And so we've had to sort of adjust and adapt. And um, luckily we've had a lot of cooperation from the landowners and farmers. And so it's proving to be a really, um, a really interesting. And one of the reasons I put this photo of this family, um, that particular female was our first nesting female. Uh, she was the first the member of the first pair to produce eggs in 2014. Unfortunately, with her first mate, they only produced infertile eggs. Um, that um, mate unfortunately died, and when she repaired, she took her new younger mate to her territory, which is a little bit, not quite how things normally work with whooping cranes, but she's pretty, she was older and she's more experienced. And she then was able to produce fertile eggs. And so that farmer has had whooping cranes on his property since 2014. He suffered through a lot of disappointing years with us. And now he called me the other day when this pair, um, when he passed by in his crawfish boat and they've laid their first eggs of this year. And he told me, we're just so proud. And that was just so wonderful to hear because he was one of our landowners who was initially quite nervous and would ask us every year, are you sure you're not going to tell me to do something different? And now this is our one of our northern, it's probably our northernmost location. We hardly go up there because he monitors the nest and the family for us. And for him to tell us that he was proud was just really wonderful. Um, you know, we've got a lot of folks who aren't quite as enthusiastic as he is, but it's a, it's a pretty interesting and a pretty good relationship. Um, and I think one that was pretty surprising when you think of whooping cranes, you think of of marsh, of wetland, of salt marsh, which the birds um, here in Texas tend to use. Um, but what we found is that they use a very different um, kind of habitat in Louisiana and it, it's working out quite well. So, um, and with that, I'm gonna let Carter um, um, talk about um, the whooping cranes that he works with and studies here um, that, that predominantly use salt marsh habitat, but they're finding them um, some interesting things that they're spending some time in some new areas as well. Oh, in Louisiana, we've got just a little over 80 in our population right now, and we've got five active 
nests right now. So we are in the thick of our nesting season. While this population is still on their wintering grounds and haven't even headed north, we've already, um, you know, we're already in the middle of our, well, in the beginning of our nesting season, so. I'm going to stick with the theme of whooping cranes not always going where we expect them to. Uh, but just uh, zoom back out to this map. George was talking about Wood Buffalo National Park. Uh, Sarah is here in southwest Louisiana. And then I'm going to take us back to where we are pretty much sitting here uh, near the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, my, my office is based in Rockport, Texas. I've got staff, uh, three staff with me here in Texas, and then I've got two staff uh, in Louisiana uh, working on outreach and ed education. They're in the crowd uh, if you look for the ICF logo. I missed some of these. <laughs> you want to add anything to these? I'll just take it from here. <laughs> All right, so we are here on the Texas coast. Um, our Aransas National Wildlife Refuge is, is here. These are Aransas wood buffalo population whooping cranes, and they're famous for being salt marsh birds. Uh, they live in our estuaries. They eat blue crabs. They eat Carolina wolfberries and a lot of other things. Um, I started in this role about a year and a half ago, and I was aware of these Granger Lake birds. Uh, they started using this area in 2011 during an extreme drought. That's pretty far from salt marsh habitat, uh, but it was sort of dismissed as this one-off thing. We were in a really bad drought, so birds might have migrated back uh, north and gone to a place that they might have stopped on the way south. Um, there was a paper published on these birds, but when I started, there was also some reports of birds in this area. Uh, a lot less data was available on these birds. There's been nothing published on these birds. Uh, there's basically no eBird reports on these birds, but there was some transmitter birds this, that used this area, so we knew that some birds were in this area. There were six reported uh, the winter before I got here, and felt like there was more and more birds using that area each year from, from sort of the anecdotal reports. So last winter, we started a full-blown research project on inland wintering whooping cranes, trying to get a handle on this. And we've been spending a lot of time here uh, the last two winters. Uh, last winter, uh, we were really surprised to find 11 birds up there, uh, a lot more than the six reported there the year before. Uh, this year, we've documented 18 birds in this area. They're using similar habitat to Louisiana birds. Uh, they are jumping back and forth between the coast, as you can see in this figure, uh, which I should have added was made by Maddie Bradshaw, our wildlife or our whooping crane biologist in the Texas office. It's a lot fancier than anything I've ever made for PowerPoint, so I like to use it a lot. But what's interesting is we you know, we expected a few birds there. We found a lot. Uh, we're finding colts there, uh, chicks from the year before. There's actually four family groups up there this year. Uh, the birds are using a much larger area uh, than they are uh, here on the coast, and they're moving a lot more. So we're still trying to wrap our heads around what this means, but what we do know for sure is there's a lot more whooping cranes using inland habitats than we realized. This has a lot of implications for how we plan for this species long term. We've always sort of expected that these birds are gonna move up the coast into more salt marsh habitat. What we didn't really plan for is these inland areas. So uh, still pretty early days and trying to get a handle on it, but it's a really exciting research project and we're pretty excited what we found so far. And we are working with a volunteer up there. He just finished his bachelor's degree. He lives up there. Uh, we added him to our research paper uh, because I used a ton of his reports uh, for my naturalist, and he's been keeping a bird journal up there for five years, so he's got some of the best data of anybody in the whooping crane world. Uh, so we're really excited to add him to this paper, um, and I think it's warranted. Uh, he also took this picture, which is better than any picture 
uh, all of my staff have been able to get in the last two years. Interestingly, if you see uh, green white is an older bird. I think it was banded in 2011. Uh, it was a coastal bird when it was banded. We did not see it up there last year, but it's up there this year. This bird is four or five years old. It's got a transmitter, so we get data points every 15 minutes. This bird has been to the coast four different times this year, but spent most of its winter up in Colorado County. So I was talking about birds in this area, and I'm gonna pass it to Liz Smith, who's my predecessor, uh, started the Texas office in 2011, about when this drought was really kicking off. And she's gonna talk about birds down here in Port Aransas. Yes, George. Yeah, it does, it does start over. So here at the beginning, well, you could see birds coming to the coast. That was in October, November. And then when the birds all start going north, uh, that's March, and then it starts over. No, uh, very few of them. There's one active transmitter in that 18 right now. So if we were just looking at the computer screen, we'd say there's at least one bird up there. And then there's two color banded birds out of the 18. Um, most of the banding happens on the breeding grounds. I'm not involved in it, but the Canadian government and the US Geological Service typically flies a helicopter, jumps out, uh, chases down the chicks and put a band on them before they're able to fly. Uh, there's been some trapping down here, uh, but a lot of it's happened uh, for chicks up there. It, they're easier to catch before they can fly. Although you do have to run through swamp after you jump out of a helicopter. Um, there's some adults banded. Uh, most of those have been trapped down here, but the data is skewed towards younger birds. So there's both, and some of the transmitters last a long time. So we get juvenile to subadult to adult. Um, anything to add on that, Liz? I'll just hand it to Liz and have her talk about it. Okay. Good evening. So. The uh, Texas coast, of course, as we mentioned, is really important to the Saransis wood buffalo population. Uh, when I was, um, when I first moved here, I was in the fifth grade, and my dad was a school teacher, and we for, uh, went a lot of things in order to go on the whooping crane boat. And I remember the first time that I saw them, they were really small, they were very far away. Uh, there were only 45 then. So um, now there's over 500. It's been an amazing you know, thing to be around as you grow up and uh, want to be a biologist and work in conservation. So um, a lot of my work has been with uh, conservation planning and habitat assessment along the Texas coast and in Mexico. And when I joined the International Crane Foundation back in 2011 um, to begin the Texas program, we really worked with the same people and the same landowners, but a real big focus on whooping cranes. They needed a lot of habitat. So on this map, you see that, you know, in the bright orange, that is the existing counties that have cranes. And then the expansion area is more in the light orange. And then um, the Louisiana non-migratory population over in green to the east. And you'll notice that there are uh, a couple of counties in Texas on the western edge um, that uh, indicate that uh, whooping cranes from Louisiana have lived there. Um, they're no longer uh, there, um, but it was a great um, experience for us to have nesting whooping cranes in Texas because it had been over 100 years since something like that had happened. So the importance of all of this work and in conserving a lot of habitat is that we want this population to continue to expand. And we know that they need really great habitat in order to do that. They're doing great on their own, um, reproducing and bringing down young um, and raising them here, teaching them what to do. That's very different from wood buffalo and the migration uh, route. And then they need to find more habitat to raise their young uh, throughout their lives. These are long lived birds. And so they, um, they tend to go to the same place. 
Now, the very interesting thing about this is that so much of um, the coastal Texas, like the rest of Texas, is privately owned. And so it's about 80% of the uh, Texas coast is privately owned. And that's you know, who we have focused on a lot as partners to make sure that there's enough habitat. The, uh, I'm, I'm a native Texan, so I've, I'm proud to say this and you know, believe it deeply, is that we really, really have a good land ethic in Texas. The land um, gives us a living. We need to take care of the land. And so many of these um, ranches and farms are being taken care of uh, very responsibly. And they love their wildlife too. So it's a great, great environment to work in. So as these cranes expand, you know, and as Carter said, these birds going inland, this is, the, this is a good future for the cranes because they do need to be opportunistic and innovative in order to work, uh, to live in a landscape, which is also changing because of development um, both urban, uh, uh, residential, commercial, and industrial. So the, the uh, work that I've been doing lately is more about the cranes uh, that have expanded southward and to Port Aransas. And they came here, a pair came here after um, Hurricane Harvey, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are very personally aware of, the, the town of uh, Rockport and of uh, Port Aransas were devastated by this storm. What happened with the natural environment was that it opened up a lot of um, marshes and tidal flats back to tidal connections. And so we think that had a lot to do with these birds exploring here and saying, you know, this is really good. And they came on January 10th in 2018 and a pair, they're unbanded, so we can't really say that it's the same pair, but these birds tend to be pretty um, tied to an area that's successful and they've returned every year, including this year. Um, and with that, they've also brought a lot of young, uh, you know, uh, with them. So uh, they have a very high percentage of success of bringing young down, uh, even twins having two birds at one time. And this year, there was another pair that showed up and it really turned into a battle, um, amazing how uh, they, the family just did not tolerate them and they did not want to leave. And there was a lot of aerial um, combat, you know, there, it was, I've never seen cranes um, move and dart like that so high in the air, in high winds. So um, we have been studying these birds uh, um, uh, since they came and there's been um, some good work come out of it, uh, a, a really great thesis and we're working on some of the the uh, papers to be published on it, because it's really important that we understand how cranes are gonna be here um, in an environment that's very different from the National Wildlife Refuge and these large ranches, because we're here. And there's a lot of development that's going on. There's a lot of industrial uh, plans that uh, will change the way the system uh, works. But the commitment of this community is amazing. And of course, we love the cranes. We're here this week, you know, to celebrate them with the Whooping Crane Festival, but they don't really like being around us. And so finding a way to, to uh, coexist with them is really important. Um, they don't give us any conflict. They're just wonderful to have around, um, but we get too close to them and they leave. So um, we're working on a, a, some real good education outreach here um, and training people to be aware of when they're too close to a crane. They're big birds, you can read them. George can read them best. It's just amazing how much they uh, convey with their behavior. So uh, next slide. So imagine, Oh, yes. Would you want to go back to that? Yeah. Uh, if you could go back one. Uh, previous. All right. So here you're seeing um, the family with two young. They're raising two young uh, in this year. And you can see that they have uh, cinnamon colored heads. Uh, they come, when they come here, they have a lot of cinnamon feathers 
um, all over their uh, body, and then they actually uh, molt into their adult uh, plumage while they're here. So these birds are a little bit later in the season, and they are um, actually very close to the boardwalk that is in the nature preserve here. Um, they tend to leave as soon as they see people or they hear people. And so they've really been moving around a lot since there's been more people using the area. There's signs, there's all kinds of great things to uh, help us um, coexist with these birds. Okay. So um, this is um, an example of some people that came up to the, um, the family and did not see them until they saw their heads come up. They immediately stopped and the birds walked past them. And once they were um, out, out of the uh, range, then they kept walking. So imagine being able to see that, but if they will fly, if you approach them and uh, we don't want that. So uh, that's a lot of the things that I'm doing. Um, I'm retired now, but I work as a, a senior research associate uh, and it's been a real pleasure to work in this community uh, more. And I, I really have the hope that we can show how these birds can live uh, in our environment too. Okay. And with that, to Ann Lacey. Hi, thank you. How many of my fellow Wisconsinites are here? Yeah, excellent. No, two hands, Jim, that doesn't count. I saw you back there, Green Bay. I, I thank you. I work um, up in Wisconsin. I'm from the uh, International Crane Foundation headquarters is where my and my staff are based. And we work in a breeding area of the reintroduction of the whooping cranes. And so this reintroduction is key to uh, the success of the recovery recovery of this species very literally because the only way to downlist, or not the only way, but a key way to downlist the species from endangered is to have two separate populations. And so Sarah and her group working in Louisiana and us working on the migratory population that is going from Wisconsin to the Southeast are hoping to hurry that goal along. So how do we do that? So in Wisconsin, it probably was on the historic edge of a range previous to European settlement. Um, and of course it was, there's a lot of reasons why the population became extirpated in Wisconsin. So you can go ahead. Um, and so we're trying to put these birds back into a landscape that looks very, very different from when whooping cranes may have been there in the 1800s and earlier. I don't like that at all. So it's very a very uh, highly human dominated landscape. Actually, I could just do it from here, I suppose. But Wisconsin has about fifty percent of its historic wetlands, so we have a very very good start. Ah, okay, I'll just keep talking. I'm good at that. Um, so we ha we are we are very lucky. We have about fifty percent of our historic wetlands in Wisconsin. Lots of crane habitat, sand hills have done very, very well. So we thought, you know, this is a, big, a good place for I'm giving away the end of the story. So this is Nasida National Wildlife Refuge in central Wisconsin. And that was the original uh, place that we wanted to, to put birds that were raised in captivity. We had to start from scratch. There was no wild birds that we could encourage. And this is what we want. We want birds out there in that landscape raising their own young. This is key. But until the birds have that experience and are old enough, we have to do it this way. We have to either raise them um, in costume, and that is not to look like a crane. That is so we don't look like people, at least. But the key is that puppet head. And so the, the chicks will focus in on that. And so we raise cohorts of birds in the costume and we can put a lot of them out in the landscape at once. And in the beginning, we also had to teach them that flyway. Um, we can't just let them go and hope for the best. Um, that, would not, that would not be the best way to do it. So famously, the first 10, 15 years of the reintroduction, they were led south by the ultralight and that built up the population. But we also wanted to start 
um, raising birds with real whooping cranes. There's probably a lot of things that people in costume might not do that a real bird can do. Um, and, or if it was me, I would never, I don't, I don't do that because I would be talking with them probably. <laughs> And that's not good. Um, so we wanted to, to do it more natural. And I, I say natural, I mean, these are birds that are in captivity. Those adults never leave. But we take then those young when they're fledged at that age and put them out in the landscape with the older birds. So then they can learn the, the migration route from those older birds. So this is how we had to start. And it's been slow going. So our greatest challenge is again to recreate this. We really want to have this happen. Lots of problems getting those young chicks from egg to chick, from chick to fledge. So be having be old enough to be flighted and then migration. So that is our greatest challenge right now is to really figure out what is holding them back from being able to fledge those chicks. And we are doing a lot of research on the breeding grounds in Wisconsin to figure out what those, those issues are. We're figuring out some, but it's a slow process. When they are slow ma to mature and there's not that many of them, it's, it's hard to figure it out um, in a research sense, but we keep trying. And this is another one of our, our, our big programs. And we, again, you've heard of some of the outreach. We have staff in Louisiana. We have staff here working in the Central Flyway and, and in Wisconsin in the Eastern Flyway, working on outreach, just making building awareness. But this in particular is the biggest problem that we fight. And that is illegal shootings of whooping cranes. That is one of the leading causes of death in whooping cranes in some of the populations. And this is, this is from a, a publication that we did. So the last uh, data set we have is from 2010 to 2014. And you can see in the blue, especially in Sarah's population, the shootings uh, proportionally hurt that population a lot more. Um, but the Eastern migratory also, it, there was just way too many um, that we were just not pleased with that. And it's a very, very difficult thing to encourage people not to do vandalistic things like that. So that is one of our biggest programs. And I just wanted to put that up there to say that our, our outreach programs is as important as our captive breeding program and our research in monitoring in the field, quite honestly. I'll leave it there and open it up for questions. You thought I was joking about the microphone, but here it is. Realizing that um, whooping cranes are part of the fabric of, of nature and uh, any effort you have toward the whooping cranes may have a reciprocal event and a reciprocal benefit to other species. Have you noticed any other benefits to other species as well to the work you're doing? I, we just pulled the numbers from some of the monitoring we're doing. So I think I have a solid, solid answer for one, one project we're doing uh, is in partnership with the Texas Water Trade, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, uh, as well as the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. Uh, we were able to purchase 200 acre feet of water, uh, which is a little over 65 million gallons of water and, and flooded 100 acres of freshwater wetlands at the Guadalupe Delta Wildlife Management Area. We are also doing monthly bird surveys to see uh, which birds are using it. Uh, we've got some game cameras up too. We haven't processed all of that data, uh, but so far this year, we've counted uh, 69 species using the water, say avian species, uh, including four whooping cranes in early November. Uh, we're really excited to see whooping cranes on the property. We, we got water the closest place we could to an area where whooping cranes are using, but we knew it was kind of iffy if they would actually find it. Uh, and they found it at least in our second year, if not in the first year, because uh, the birds were documented there. But in the meantime, Tons of other species are using it, and really large numbers of water birds. Uh, so 
Certainly getting these habitats out on the landscape benefits a lot of other species. Uh, Liz, I bet, can add to that with some of her monitoring after George. Well, you, you saw, <clears throat> if you were out in the boat, all these beautiful marshes and pelicans and all kinds of birds all over the place. That area is protected because the whooping cranes are here. And uh, there's just an enormous number of other members of wildlife that are using the same habitats. And um, all over the world, uh, people know cranes. They can see cranes, they're big, they're beautiful. And um, literally millions of acres of land worldwide have been protected because cranes are on it. And not only are you protecting all this other wildlife, but you're protecting the water. For example, in Africa, a lot of people depend during the dry season on water that seeps out of the wetlands. Carelessly, some wetlands have been drained and then the, the humans don't have water. So we're using the cranes in Africa, for example, as a, an indicator of the health of the water, water for everybody, wildlife and people. So cranes are very, very important birds as indicators of the environment we all share. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And this question is um, directed to Liz Smith. Um, in regard to that other pair that was seen in the fall in the Charlie's pasture and the aerial dog fights that pursued and Paula got such wonderful footage of, uh, where did that other pair get chased off to further south or inland? working how about now okay um yeah it's a really good question because you know it's really exciting to be on these edges of these expanding populations because we're used to them being interacting with each other within the core range all the time and so they spend a lot of time uh you know uh, defending um, their territories uh you know making sure that they have enough for their young throughout the year in or the winter. And so here we have some cranes that lived by themselves at the edge of the range. And our behavior data shows that they didn't do a lot of, spend a lot of time in a, in a um, crane to crane defense. So they spent a lot more time feeding and, uh, and, and comfort, you know, like loafing and preening. And now, you know, this year when the cranes, the pair came, there was this, oh my gosh, you've got to go. And it was relentless. I mean, you know, the, the male was just like, no, this isn't gonna happen. And the others were like, hey, there's plenty of room. And from our, from our um, data in past years, it seems like there is, but they hadn't had anybody challenge them before. And bird, you know, cranes are like any, any living being, they have their own personalities. And apparently this is a very, very, uh, you know, pugnacious male. <laughs> Um, but the fact that they left, and they're not banded, so we don't know, but they left and then they came back, it was like they didn't want to give it up, you know. Uh, they started moving south. They were, um, you know, just from the human um, involvement and also these two uh, pairs battling it out, they've moved further down the Mustang Island. There's a lot of habitat on Mustang Island, so this could be good. But they're fine, they're, they're working it out on their own. Um, there's some uh, thought that there's a a pair that's on the south end of San Jose that could be them. But again, you just you just have to wonder. So uh, really, really neat to see this develop. Thank you. Thank you. Is it gone? OK. Uh, one of the principles in crane biology is that <clears throat> 
male cranes come back to the area where their parents are breeding. And often they will take a slice of the breeding habitat of their parents. Uh, in this way, the parents are helping their own genes to survive and breed. And Dr. T or Tom Stain, who studied whooping cranes for many years at Aransas, and from 1975 to 1987, most of the young cranes in Wood Buffalo National Park were banded so we could learn a lot more about their life history. And Tom documented that the male of a pair of cranes would come back and eventually establish a winter territory near his parents. So I'm wondering, um, my guess is th those two cranes come back. One scenario could be that those are the two chicks from last year and they're very familiar with this area and they want to come back. But last spring, they were likely driven off by their parents up in Wood Buffalo, Buffalo National Park. And the last thing they want to see is those chicks back on their territory here in the winter. And they want to get them off because they have another chick that they're rearing. I mean, that's one story that might be true. It could prob possibly be true. It could be, it's a completely strange pair that's looking for a place to breathe and they are definitely not wanted. They're not next to kin. <laughs> uh, so it's in the crane world, it's very fascinating how these things are happening. Uh, on the breeding ground, the male will come back to the area where he was raised near his parents, but the female will go far away, maybe 50 or 60 miles away. So the chance of siblings pairing together is very, very low because of the difference in behavior of the male and the female. Do you know the average amount of land that each pair of cranes need to defend here in Texas, like in 600 acres, 900 acres? So, uh as George mentioned, when there were fewer cranes, they were able to do a lot more monitoring and they were able to do it more frequently than, uh, than they're able to now. The population was much lower and they could cover the area. So there was a lot of work done on uh, mapping territories um, within and around Aransas Wildlife Refuge. Um, what seemed to be the norm was anywhere from 250 acres to 500 acres. So when you think about a section of land being like 644 acres, that would only support two families. So um, it also looked like on the barrier islands that the that territories were larger, and it could be that the habitat on the on uh, the Ramses Wildlife Refuge was uh, you know have higher quality. We don't know, but sometime around in like the 2010 11. We had a really severe drought and it lasted for three years. And these birds were heavily affected by that and began moving around a lot more. We also had new transmitters on them and that were uh, much, much improved and they were getting readings from these birds in their location. And so there was a lot more movement and it never has really returned to that real tight um, territorial defense. Uh, one explanation that's been given by a, a whooping crane uh, biologist that works real, worked real closely with these cranes, banding them and, and you know, being around them for three months, was that he feels that their, their behavior and their um, level of, of defensiveness is also very different. And that we see defensive behavior from birds and we don't notice the ones that are more uh, ameliorating towards each other, you know, they just tolerate. Um, if there's more relatedness, you know, just in terms of, um, you know, how many birds have come to a certain area, you, you see a little bit more packing. So, um, but it still is a large amount of habitat. And this acres that I mentioned earlier was really just for salt marsh. And so they use a lot of the prairies and they use a lot of the freshwater 
you know, um, uh, wetlands along the coast. So um, it still is going to require a lot, a lot of conservation efforts and management. I'm interested in uh, also the other populations and how uh, they relate to territories and how much they need. Yeah, we haven't um, done a, a specific analysis on that in Louisiana yet, but we have seen, um, and the population is still so small that they're pretty well spread out for where we have nesting territories. So they're not really bumping up against each other yet, um, but we have seen um, I think with the first chick that, that fledged in the Louisiana population, um, we sort of did a, a rough um, calculation and that pair nested and then fledged a chick in, um, I think it was like 175 acres. I think it was under or just over 200 acres. So a fairly small area. What we found is that in some of these rice and crawfish farms, um, the birds aren't having to move around as much. They can um, forage safely roost and nest and raise chicks all in the same field. Sometimes they don't leave the same field all day and night. Um, whereas sometimes if the salt marsh is saltier and that's impacting food, they might have to, the birds over here might have to fly to an area to get fresh water. But in, in Louisiana, we don't see that. And so we are seeing some birds that seem to be occupying and maybe being successful in a much smaller area but we just don't have enough pairs yet where they're sort of bumping up against each other and having territorial battles. We've seen some battles between previous offspring and parents when they come back and other birds who just randomly come across, but um, we don't sort of have enough breeding pairs that they're you know, stacking up right next to each other yet. So it'll be interesting to see as the population grows, but I think there's, there's plenty of room, but it does seem like maybe they can be successful in smaller amounts of area. Speaking for the other migratory population, the eastern migratory population, definitely territorial on their their breeding grounds, of course. And again, we don't have that many, so they can their territories can be as big or small as they need. But just in general, the answer to that is is if they they can have a small territory, if they can get all their needs met, um, and feed one or two chicks also. And so they can do, they can live in a smaller area, and they will defend a larger area if it's sub quality like you said if it's a higher quality so you can almost tell the quality of the the habitat by the size of the territory um but different to the arancis wood buffalo population we have not documented territoriality in our wintering grounds um, our um, whooping cranes in the eastern flyway tend to follow the sand hills and they are in larger groups um and is that territory driven or is that just habit or new behavior some family groups do segregate themselves out and they will kind of carve out a spot for themselves away from a larger group. So that's kind of being territorial. It, it's defending a space so they have the resources for those chicks, but it's not uh, as formal as territory as we have seen down here in the Texas coast. Well, um, <clears throat> in our Eastern migratory uh, flocks, they love cornfields and they get earthworms there and they get a lot of waste corn and so on. And they're not territorial on their wintering grounds. And I want to ask uh, Carter, now here at Aransas along the coast, they're looking for blue crabs and wolf berries and they have their territories, they're spread out. When they go to Granger Lake and they go to Garwood and other areas inland, where they're feeding more in agricultural fields, are they less territorial than the birds along the coast? Uh, we've seen a little bit of aggressive interaction. I'm not sure they're territorial per se, but some aggression, but not a lot. I've seen none. I've never really seen groups interact up there, but Maddie has been up there a lot more than me and she's seen it occasionally. Uh, we're also, you mentioned blue crabs. We're trying to figure out what they're eating up there, uh, but we haven't been close enough very often. They're fairly skittish up there, uh, but we, we're pretty certain they're eating waste rice as I think the birds in Louisiana are. Uh, we think they're probably eating uh, nut sedge tubers, which we know they'll eat in migration. So it makes sense they'd eat them down here in the winter. Uh, I am 100% certain they're not eating blue crabs up there. Uh, that's the one thing I'm for sure. Uh, but we're hoping to get a little bit closer and, and better document the diet up there. 
because uh, it does have sort of enormous implications uh, for energetics if they're moving more and their diet appears to be probably a lot less protein rich uh, as the birds here on the coast. Hi, um, I was curious with the shootings of, of the uh, cranes, if there was any overlap of that in areas where hunting of sandhill cranes is legal and a misidentification? That, that is a good question and it is often asked. And we definitely want to make clear that this is not hunters that are accidentally shooting cranes 99.9% .9 of the time. There was one incident where a, a hunter was in a sandhill zone. It turns out that he technically it was illegal because he was either shooting before hours or it was a closed area and he didn't know or didn't care. But this is definitely, they are um, people that are out to do harm to whooping cranes. It, it is intentional. It is so, it is not, it's not accidental. Um, that is that is something that we um, count differently. But that graph that I showed was intentionally going out and shooting whooping cranes. It wasn't accidental. Oops, hunting accident. Which um, most states that have sandhill crane hunting, in fact, all the states I think, and hopefully Canadian provinces that have sandhill crane hunting, you have to pass a test. A test. But you have to at least acknowledge that there are whooping cranes in the area and you know the difference between the two and that you can identify them and you have to, to do that, go through that before you get a hunting license. So, um, and that's what a lot of our outreach is trying to do as well is just to let people know that there's whooping cranes in their, in their area and, and build a community pride also. So if there are people out there doing nefarious deeds that, you know, that there might be a little bit of peer pressure even to keep them from, from doing that. But it's a, it's a tough, tough thing. Yep, those two people that are sitting in front of you do that for a living. Is it on? Uh -huh. uh, in our new Eastern population, one of our first birds to breed was shot in Indiana and was was caught and the judge fined him one dollar he said i'm sorry i didn't know what it was and um, so the crane foundation our employees have worked with the judiciary to inform them in the trial how much it costs to produce that crane We've estimated to put one whooping crane on the landscape in Wisconsin costs about $100,000 per bird. That includes the cost of keeping their parents in captivity for years, breeding them, people raising them and monitoring them. It's a very expensive operation. And now Liz, you were very helpful in working with the courts down here in a case in Texas and tell us about what the verdict was. Right, so the um, two of uh, the Louisiana population of, uh, that Sarah works on uh, in Texas were shot uh, intentionally by a 17 year old who had, you know, um, he was doing whatever he wanted, you know, shooting whatever he wanted. So. Uh, he really, uh, he, he kind of zoned in on them uh, because they said, well, you can't shoot them. So he proved that wrong. Uh, what was really good about this case was we all, you know, all worked together and tried to uh, ensure that the, that the judge and the district attorney were well informed. Um, we got a lot of advice from our federal um, uh, agents on how to, how to make the most impact. And we got uh, lots of uh, groups together um, that came, wrote letters, but also came to the um, arraignment. Uh, and uh, we had recommendations, you know, for sentencing, et cetera. Uh, this um, has been done uh, several times since then um, in Louisiana and uh, in uh, Indiana, I think, again. But, you know, we're ready. And then the Oklahoma 
uh, three cranes were shot a uh, couple of years ago, four years, four, four cranes, four, maybe five. And so, and you know more how that turned out. So that's the sentence, the sentence. Okay, the sentence for this um, young man uh, was actually kind of interesting because he, uh, he did have to pay restitution for the cranes. And then he also um, was on uh, five years probation. And the thing that really got him the most was that he had his um, fishing and hunting license suspended in all 50 states for those five years. And that meant that if he broke the law anywhere, that he would go to the federal prison. Um, I don't, he didn't last very long before he did something. And he spent time in federal prison. Um, so I think that the, uh, you know, how, how you reach that sector is very difficult to understand. Um, and our outreach um, uh, uh, people are constantly finding ways to communicate, get support, but also see what we can do about um, making people realize that we just can't afford it. Um, but that's a, this is a tough one. And I know that that Sarah has done a lot of work on that, and it's not an easy easy job either. So we have time for one more question. So as a follow on to that, um, I noticed your data only went to 2014. Um, do you have any more recent indicators of the trending on the damage and uh, destruction of birds? Yeah, I think Andy Caven, our, our vice president, uh, Ann and my boss worked with Stephanie to update those numbers in his, his paper last year. And surprisingly, it seems like uh, there's more whooping cranes on the landscape, but there's also a lot more shootings. So it seems like this problem is actually increasing, not decreasing. Um, I suspect it's possibly because birds are moving into areas they didn't used to be, so they're interacting with people they didn't used to. Uh, but that is sort of speculation on my part. Uh, the case in Oklahoma was just settled in October. Uh, they had four different shooters for four cranes. There was possibly a fifth crane they didn't throw in to the charges. Um, all of the, they pled guilty. They were charged 17,000 each, which is a little light, but I think it was a plea deal. Um, and they lost their guns and hunting privileges for about five years, I believe. Anything to add to that, Ann? All right, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Let's give us everyone a round of applause. I have to say thank you again to the panel for coming and doing this such short notice for our public lecture series. We really appreciate it, thank you. All right, so before everybody leaves, our last public lecture is next Thursday and it is our Margaret A. Davidson fellow, Kyle Runyon, and he will be talking about the research that he's been doing here at Mission Aransas. Join us, same time, same place, thank you.